delineate upper abs. You can't delineate lower I'm going to do my lower abs today because they're all far up at once. And you can also pour different layers like plywood. And one layer of plywood is pretty deep, but all four layers together are pretty strong. So your body is engineered to fire all, the, all four layers at once. And so it sets the stone for your body to create shock waves to your appendages. And at that point, the shock waves would be the point where your muscles turn off. It cracks the whip. So for example, a baseball player would set the stone with the hip, create the shock waves, and then release, crack the whip, or Bruce Lee would set the stone, the leg goes in the air, and when the foot hits the face, is when he cracks the whip and does a super stiffness, or the golf player set the stone with the hip, turns off, cracks the whip with the golf club hitting the, the ball. Use the hips as the driver, basically that's just what I just said. Tighten up loose spokes. Now, this is where I'm talking about uh, really mobile people that just keep stretching when they shouldn't have to stretch and they're making themselves a little more inefficient. Um, if you think of your the human body as a tire, the spokes, and the tire is a little bit bent, you can, you will not try to loosen up the tight spokes to get that tire true. And then that tire will become a little more unstable, right? It'll be a little looser. Even if that tire gets a little straighter, it's going to be, if it hits a rock, it's just going to buckle a bit more. The, the better answer would be to try to tighten up the loose spokes. And that's easier said than done. Like I said before, I find it easier to help tight people get more mobile, but to get a loose person more tight, that's, that's hard. And I, I can't seem to get that down pat. And I don't think it's, a lot of that's genetic from a lot of people. Um, but the main thing is to tighten up loose spokes is to uh, not stretch it <laughs> anymore. And that's step one. And that's the first step to making that hip a little bit tighter. Uh, also, you can do some stabilization exercises for that as well. Don't concentrate on loosening tight spokes. Don't loosen up loose spokes <laughs> either. <laughs> and I see that a lot in cam work. There's a lot of yoga people that love to do dynamic sport, and they love doing yoga. They're really flexible, and they're really good at it, and they're further destabilizing their body, but then they'll go out and do um, some of the top marathon or whatever, and they'll have some tightness going on in their back or their joints. So it depends what you want to do in your life. It's how far you do, what type of stretch you need. If you drink a lot of water, this fascia has a lot of water. Um, in vitro experiments show that increased hydration goes along with increased stiffness. Um, stiffness not being a negative in this sense, stiffness being um, stabilization with movement in the body. Increased temperature of fascia, heat enhances the process of taking of water and drainage, that, that drainage pump between the fascial tissue in and out of the, uh, the tendons, for example, when the collagen matrix was lined up. Worry about using intervals. So you do a little, like I said, when I, before I do my uh, uh, adrenaline race I, on my bike, I do two intervals. I cool down, replenish my fascia, get my heart rate down a bit, explode up, get my heart rate. You can do that four or five times and get my blood vessels basal dilated. Because you don't want to be on all the time. You don't want to get acidic either. Get faster, a chance to rehydrate. Definitely in your warm up, you want to start slow in your movements and a little bit less range of motion. Then you start to get a little deeper in your range of motion, a little faster in your movements, depending on your sport that you're getting ready for. Myofascial release, massage, or tonal, and we talked about before. And I already told you the reasons for that. Warming up to prevent injury. The three most popular areas of injury in North America, North Americans are 
knees, lower back, and neck. The three, three least mobile areas of the body in North America are foot and the ankle, hips and the butt, and the thorax and scapula. And I talk about that a lot in my TRX classes. And these are the main reasons we do movement preparation exercises for those three areas of the human body. The foot and the ankle gets really weak and destabilized in North Americans wear a lot of supportive shoes. And the foot gets, if you don't use it, you lose it. Like I say, like uh, Africans and uh, some of them don't have money for proper shoes and they have really strong feet and really good tensile integrity in their feet to explode off of. Um, and that's why I do exercises with no shoes, just to stimulate the the ligaments underneath the foot. The hips and the butt, we sit on a lot. Whether, no matter how active we are, we're sitting at a desk, we're driving a lot, we're eating, we're sitting and watching TV, we're sometimes going to the gym and sitting in the machine. I was at a, my very first TRX um, course I took eight years ago with Fraser. <coughs> he said that um, there was an experiment on North Americans that on average, North Americans stand or uh, are operate about an hour in the day because we rest or sleeping and stuff like that. One hour? One hour. Wow. Well, Camelot is different. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. But yeah, that was a, that's what he said. And then the thorax and scap thorax, meaning the, the spinal cord that all the rib cage attaches to. Um, and that doesn't tend to rotate as much because we tend to mold ourselves in the here. You can't rotate when you're here, but when you're here, it's a lot better for rotation. So when you're here, uh, you can't rotate. Guess where you're rotating more is right here. And then that's causing a lot of extra movement in the lower back and causing a little too much mobility in the lower back or flexibility, which means if that's happening, the body will recruit muscles to tighten up to protect it. And so then people are trying to stretch their lower back. Instead, they should be trying to tighten up the joint. And then the muscles are just go, oh, thank you. Uh, so if the, butt, if the butt and the hips do their job in range of motion, then the lower back will go, thank you. So if your rib cage is doing its job in range of motion and your shoulder blades are moving independently of your rib cage, then your lower back will go, thanks for doing your job. I've been doing it too long. So the conclusion, when you warm up for sport, you want to prepare the foot and ankle for sport. And, uh, and that depends on the sport as well. Wear no shoes in your warm up when you do that. You want to make sure you incorporate a balance exercise, preferably on one leg when you're warming up for your ankle. You want to <coughs> roll. Use the upper body to stimulate the lower body. So tilting or twisting the upper body to, well, let's do a little experiment, stand up for one second. You don't have to take your shoes off, of course. You do a little experiment to stimulate your ankles with your upper body. And you get Deborah warmed up too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna do a little bit of a hip hinge on your left leg, for example. The posture, you're not slouching, so do that right now. Balance on one leg. If you have problems balancing, you can use your toe on the back just to help balance a little bit. Stick your butt back a little bit so your bum's fired up. Then you're gonna reach with one arm, reach with the other, reach with one arm on one leg, and then you're gonna go faster. And then you're gonna go faster. Are you finding some ankle movements happening? You're supinating and pronating <laughs> your ankle. That's a yes. great ankle exercise. And that's instead of in the old days when I was a physical you can sit down now. In the old days when I was um, volunteering as a physiotherapist to see if I wanted to do that as a cure, they would do ankle stuff like scrunch the towel up with your feet or stuff like that, but that's a little more productive. Using your upper body fascia to tug on your ankle fascia. You want to load, then unload the big toe. You know, I talk about that a lot in my classes where you load that big toe and that locks the ankle joint. It sets the stone down here, transmits energy up to your abs. And we tend not to do that as much anymore. We get injured a lot, or we sit a lot, and we tend to walk a lot shorter gait. And 
we don't load that big flow anymore, which sends up ground reaction forces and fires up the abs. And then when you're warming up, you start easy, and then you increase the speed. Like I started to slow, and then increase our speed of twisting. So then you also want to prepare your hips and buffers for it. You want to incorporate the hip lift, some hip lifts or hip hinges, <coughs> or squats, or lunges, and a whole bunch of variations and patterns with that. And you want to make sure you use your heel when you're doing a warm up, because the heel fires up the bum, it's a direct link. You want to use those and unload the big toe for your hips. You can see lots of crossovers in these warm ups. You want to spread the floor with your feet uh, for some squat sometime or some sort of deadlift. Spread the floor, fires up your lateral hips. You want to make sure your posture when you're loading your hips, or if you don't have posture when you're trying to load your hips, then your lower back becomes your bum. It's called the North American bum. And <laughs> so posture will help your bum do its job want to twist. Then you want to start slow to so increase the range of motion as you get in your warm-up. Now we're going to talk about preparing the thorax, the scapula, the mid-back, the shoulder blades for sport. You want to incorporate a twist with a squat or a lunge. And every time I want to someone's got shoulder issues and it's usually because the shoulder blade is a little bit stuck to your, your rib cage and will have an impingement or something. So I work on trying to get their shoulder blades, get them out of the way instead of doing a trying to strengthen their rotator cuff. Because that's still there's still a structure in the way. That, doing that all day is not gonna help as much as trying to get the shoulder blade to depress and internally rotate and it's usually a lot more beneficial if you can get your butt down and then do a shoulder blade exercise because the, the, the butt and the fractal lumbar fascia through here anchors the shoulder blades and it's a little bit easier for the shoulder blades to draw down when your bum is fired up. So then, now your butt's fired up and your shoulder blades are drawing down, but now you have good posture and then your abs are firing. So when I'm working on the shoulder blades, I'm making sure that the abs and the bum are fired up at the same time. If I want to work on somebody's abs, I want to make sure the shoulder blades and the butt are working. If someone's got hip issues, I got to make sure that the shoulder blades and the butt and the abs are working. So there's that whole midsection. The whole midsection is the driver of the human body. You got to make sure all three of those things are working. A little bit off track, but that's okay. Deep hip range of motion creates a foundation from which to twist from. So if I were to do standing up like this and twisting, it's really easy for me to uh, get my lower back involved or not set the stone in my hips. If I can get down here and I can twist up to here, then it feels a little more through my rib cage. When you're doing some twisting with your thoracic spine, you want to leave with the chest. You want to relax your neck when twisting. A lot of people tend to throw, built or wired to do this a lot with hand put a lot of stress in here. We'll try to stabilize up the neck instead of our, our mid-back right down through here. You want posture, of course. You can't twist with a sludge. And you want to attempt to dissociate your scapula from your thorax. You want to attempt to get them moving independently. And you want to start slow. Start easy. Now, we're going to we'll probably just keep going, right? Mm -hmm. So we're at the last section of the talk. We're going to start collecting and organizing all these thoughts. Cause what do we do with all this information? We have the components of a warm up first of all. You need to load the muscle when you warm up. You need to change direction of the load. You need to move in rhythm. You need full range motion of the sport. You need full body movements. 
You need posture. You need to incorporate twisting. You need to pulse the body, turn it on and off. You need to set the stone. You do not lose loose spokes. So one warm up for one person is not going to be good for every single person. You need to get a little more of a customized warm up for you. Prepare the foot and ankle. You gotta prepare the hips. You gotta prepare the spine, the T spine specifically. No static stretching in your warm up. Up regulate the nervous system. That's with doing balance exercises with it, or you're doing generally ladder stuff if it's applicable for your exercise at hand. Then you're gonna build into sport specific movements. You wanna start start slow and then move faster. And we're almost done. So, I broke down what a warm up should be into a couple different components. This is my own customization here. A warm up protocol outline. The first part, there's four different parts of a warm up before you do your sport. If you want to do it perfectly, if you have time for it as well, is number one is to mobilize first. That could be a massage or foam rolling. You don't need to warm up for that. And specifically, specifically for that person, if you're tight in your, most people are tight in their IT bands. Um, so that's because you can spot most people are tight in their piriformers through here, and that's easy to spot. Um, and, then, and then from there, get into some dynamic stretching if that person at all needs it for the sport. If you're really loose in your entire body for that sport, I wouldn't even bother stretching out, just get on with the, the second round of warm up, which is the stabilization. Stabilize second, mobilize first, stabilize second. And stabilizing requires ground reaction forces or pedal reaction forces. So it depends on your sport, but you can do skips and hops or jumps. Agility exercises for brain games, like over here. Really good for soccer. Lots of things to change direction. And then you want to start getting your heart rate up after that. So we've got some range of motion. We've turned on some nerves. Now we want to get the heart rate up, get the vasodilation going. You're sweating a little bit. You want to hit the wall before you're actually competing. But if you just went on a leisurely ride, you might as well just hit the wall and you're leisurely ride and then enjoy it after. It doesn't really matter that much. But, um, and if you're going running, for example, yeah, start light. Don't start sprinting and running fast. And then the third part, more applicable for people that really are competing in sport, is you want to start getting sport specific in your range of motion, sport specific in your change of direction, sport specific in your speed, and sport specific in your anticipation of muscle. So you're you're really working, like for example, if you are getting ready to do your sports five minutes, or if you have 10 minutes just before you're competing, you're actually doing some hurdles, and you're actually getting your body moving at the speed that you want your body to be moving in the competition. You don't want to put your body into the shock. For example, when I'm warming up, when I used to race downhill bike racing, uh, I start by practicing the course slowly, and as I got closer to the actual race, I'm, ra I'm doing practicing the course at the speed I probably want to race. So when it gets time to doing the actual race, you're you're already riding at that speed that you're comfortable with. And your body and your joints and everything's able to do that or ready for it. And then there's the, the last part is the stabilization fifth. Or, um, if you're in competition and you've warmed up, now you have to wait another 15 minutes because you're getting ready for your race. You can't just stand there and lose what you've gained in your warm up. And you can't really do all these other things because you're in a lineup, you're ready to race or whatever it is. Um, do these and that while you're in the lineup. I was in a lineup for a bump bike races and I would be doing a bunch of jump squats or I'd be doing uh, twisting with, with squats to open up my hips a bit. Any questions so far on that? That's where we're at for specific warm ups. And we can brainstorm at this point if you want on any sports that you have that you want to 
on the fly to make a warm up for. Yeah. How warm up for is a down the ski when you hop in the car and drive the car? Yeah, I was afraid. I knew this would be the hard part of my talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was ready for that. So we'll go back to this slide and your downhill skiing. Um, if you're at home, before you get in the car, you can probably do that, foam rolling. And if you know your body, and someone's told you that you're tight in certain areas of your body, you can just concentrate on those areas. If you're loose, don't worry about it. Um, you could also do some dynamic stretching at home. I mean, it's in the morning, you can go skiing. So you definitely want to get up a little earlier, get the body upright, and past that 30 minute mark where you've been sleeping for a while and your, your spinal cord has been in a position of plastic information for <coughs> hard to sleep. So you want to get the system working for half an hour and then you want to start to warm up, ideally. Yeah. And so when you're over here, when you get to the ski hill, <laughs> a lot of people will do this kind of stuff because it looks silly, <laughs> first of all. Um, It gets to a point where your first run or your first two runs are green runs, hopefully, and you're just waking up that body and getting small range of motion when you're doing your first run. And then you're getting into bigger, deeper range of motion and more aggressively. It's like warm up the tires of the, of the race car, get it going. And it's usually for me because um, I tend to be a, a tighter person, which has benefits once I warm up. but by the third run, I'm like, yeah, I'm having fun. So at that point, doing this kind of stuff is not going to be applicable for you. Just warm up during your first run. Don't, don't go with a crazy person. Well, I'm going down the hole right away the first run. and say, no, I'll see you after I warm up. Um, and the cardio, if your skiing's not a huge cardio-respiratory exercise, so you don't really need to get past the wall for that. This part will open up your blood vessels after like the second run at 5 p.m. So you don't need to get a sweat on. So that's not critical for you. That's the part where it depends. And then by your third run, you can get a little more to your level. You're not competing, but you want to be safe in injury prevention. And you want to degenerate joints. And that'll be it. Yeah. Anybody else? Interesting what you've described. The, the ancient Chinese really didn't know the science behind it, but when they come up with 5G, that's what they do. Exactly. That's, that's a great point. <coughs> We've been doing a lot of these things for hundreds of years and just didn't know why we were doing it. But now there's a lot of the things are a lot of components that we've been doing for hundreds of years. Now it's getting a little more organized or maybe a little more fine tuned um, some of the movements. For example, like we've been Humans have been doing yoga for many, many, many years. Um, but now there should be a point where you shouldn't do too much if you want to compete in a highly uh, sport that requires a lot of ground reaction force. Or maybe you shouldn't really be bending the spine and rotating a little bit. To, to our, our spinal cord is meant to bend, but we're, not, we're living a lot longer than we should in um, medicine and hospitals. And so we want to still enjoy our spinal cord. There's no lifetime warranty on your spinal cord. You can't go in and replace it, you know? So, spinal cord's meant to bend and twist, but so now we gotta learn how to protect it a little longer, keep it working a lot longer, and enjoy it. So we're more bipedal in our retirement. Stay out of the wheelchair as long as we can. We live longer and happier and independent. Um, any more questions? So we should, should we be doing something like this when we come in for uh, a workout at the gym? Yeah, that depends. <laughs> so for your workout, we can talk about that right now, right? So you're basically trying to be healthy for life, right? Mm -hmm. I got that right? Yeah. So, yeah, you have been starting with this kind of stuff already. I've been doing it, but not necessarily starting. No. You can start. It will help your enjoyment of your workout. And... Uh, so you can get the range of motion a little quicker when you're doing your warm-ups. And then you can get into your dynamic stretching, the dynamic movements if you're doing that, which includes a, a 
entire body with the shoulder blades and butt abs? Well, there's lots of different ones, but dynamic stretching, like one of the greatest dynamic stretches for the entire body is a walking lunge with an overhead extension, and then maybe a twist with your chest, and then getting back down to here again, and then and keep walking, not holding it, and every time you stand up, everything's turning off, and then everything turns on, and grab your of course, it's got, it's got range motion, it's got uh, twisting, um, and that could be your dynamic stretch for that day. And then the next day could be a little bit different. You can do a, you do a walking lunge with a crossover and then twist out. And so then you're getting to a point where it's different every day. And you're stressing the postural tissue different every day. Also, you can get to a point where you're holding elastic band when you're doing that kind of stuff. You've got the elastic band and you've got some upper body resistance. You the upper body engaged. Because the lower body is already engaged with gravity. Um, and since no one in here is really getting ready to do sports on the high end, um, you can do all those for, and everyone's probably doing four or five sports for fun. So you can probably do all those deep range of motion. You wouldn't have to worry about doing too much um, for that sport if you're not doing the way up type of thing, you know? Um, so after Home rolling, getting into that. And that's why this, if you see me training my clients, I'm only doing that running track. And that part of that warm up is a lot of walking variations of lunges. Um, and if they're really loose in lateral hips, which I have a bunch of those clients, and I'll get them to do resistance laterally with the lunge. And get that tensional integrity going through there. Um, so then, Gene. So, so you know, getting on the bike for five minutes or, or on the treadmill or something, is that's out now, so. You can do that, definitely. That, I mean, that was always sort of the idea. And that's not, right, not right. going to hurt you, yeah, for sure. And that will help turn on your computer, especially if it's in the morning, you know, start light, get the body moving a little bit. And then, I mean, it's all time. There's a little You can warm up for two hours if you want to. Yeah. You really have a really big structure. Um, I'm just giving you the ideal thing if you had the time and you really wanted to do it properly. Otherwise, if you don't have time, just if I'm going to go for a bike ride, I'm just going to start slow, you know, and build it up faster. But for Eugene, doing the agility ladder stuff would be really good because you, you, there's lots of different ways to do that kind of thing. And you get to a point where you do the agility ladder, different movements pattern and you screw up, that's great. And then you want to slow it down until you do it perfectly and speed it up until you make a mistake again because that's the brain connecting to the body and that's really productive. Is that the one that's it? Yeah, that's it's it's on the floor. So there's lots of different ways to do it. But really important for the, the longevity of the brain as well. The brain needs the, the body to move for the function of it. More so than, for example, a lumosity on you know, the computer. It's really good for the brain, but if you can do a lumosity with body movements, you know what I mean by lumosity? Mm -hmm. Well, there's this thing on the internet you can subscribe to where it's uh, brain games to help you exercise your brain. But if they had that with exercise, then that would be tenfold better. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, your cardio component or I can add your cardio component into your workout. For example, I will do uh, BOSU strides. You get the heart rate up as well when the BOSU get down the heat. You get the heart rate up for 30 seconds or a minute and then I'll get them doing an ab exercise and go back and forth. Um, I would just start them off slow with that kind of thing and then reassess the situation, how they're doing and maybe build them up a bit more. But um, for working out, I would just include that in the workout. Just start slow. And you don't really have to worry about that part. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? You, you mentioned earlier that um, recovery helped with, um, pardon me, warm up helped with recovery. Yeah. And how does that play out? Well, it's just preparing your body better so you're not. Um, Moving together, so you're moving a little more.
efficiently. And so then if you, if you did get injured, that your body has been moving better and, and more liquid, that if you were in recovery mode, then you're going to recover better. Because your body has been preparing over the years really good for sport. Instead of just off the couch, off the couch and blasting your body, and then it's going to be moving in a limited range of motion with a lot of degeneration of the joint and then the fascial tissue just to, to stick to each other because there has been that delineation. So it's basically just you're reinforcing bad movement when you're not warming up properly and you're not going to recover as fast. That's all. So when you're running a half marathon, for example, yep. like half, you know, the second day you can barely walk or whatever. Just keep moving. So just keep moving. So is that because that. you haven't sort of always been on that warm-up protocol like you are with that with prep? That would be good for the warm down. And the warm so you could really like a like a marathon lots of repetition, ground action forces, and inflammation, and pounding. And so yeah, if you're really sore, I just keep moving just to keep the, the, the blood flowing and the lymphatic system going and circulating and replenishing, synovial fluid replenishing, you're going to recover a lot faster. But and this kind of stuff would be good even prior to that, yeah. just in prep for the upcoming race. Yeah. After, after your, even the next day, do your rolling in, in range of motion. You might have to do assisted range of motion, like with the TRX to get down and let down the ring to a range of motion with posture. You're going to recover a lot faster. And you won't necessarily have to do a, a skip from the hop and stuff like that after you're out, just concentrate more on the rolling and the range of motion, dynamic stretching, even over. But prior to, like, in prep, so... In prep, prep so if we're talking about that specifically, we can go through that. You can do your, your rolling and then your range of motion. Um, and if you're a particularly tight person, doing big lunges may not be, well, may be okay, because you're going to meet yourself halfway when you're starting to do a running stride. But if you're a really mobile person, doing a deep lunge before you start running, you're going to... Um, an energy leak in your stride because you're trying to stretch out that spring in your hamstring that you need that spring to bounce off of the ground with and you're going to make it harder more labor intensive for you to run so deep lunges in that case would be ideal kind of like stretching in the range of motion maybe some twisting in the range of motion of your angle if you knew the exact angle of the ground most people don't run like this right Lunge. Almost like a straight leg with soft knees and soft hips. And uh, your whole body will <coughs> fire up along the chain, just uh, stabilize the joints, ground around to force, turn your whole body into a stick, and bounce off the ground, and then the next drive. Okay, I have a question. You, you brought up hamstring here. Yeah. You, and you want them to be using their hamstring spring. Yep. Yet, I find a lot of individuals I work with have tight hamstrings. Yeah. So how do they address that? Not necessarily get it more flexible, but yeah. more functional, more fascial, less fascial restrictions and stuff like that. Because I think that still really affects if their hamstrings aren't yeah. um, mm -hmm. lengthening properly, mm -hmm. then I think they are using too much of their low back, like yeah. you're getting knee injuries. So, what do they do warm up wise? Well, you can Brain talk point. about running, or sure. you know, what does she do for her hamstring when she's climbing? Yeah. To, I don't want her to be losing. Are we energy. talking about a tight person, or are you talking about no, no. a tight person? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> a tight person. I would roll out their roll out their hamstrings a bit. Probably their glutes too. It's probably all, it's all connected. And, um, and if they are going for a run, and if they are a tight person, like I said to Jenny, um, doing some deep lunges will probably meet them halfway when it comes time to do the stride for their run. If you're a loosey goosey person doing deep lunges and getting ready for running, I would, I would speculate that that's going to destabilize and make them a little more efficient for their mm -hmm. run. Yeah. A tight person can do deep lunges. And 
then they'll they're not gonna be really themselves without you know one about they're gonna meet halfway of it. So they could do walking these ones in this preparation for a run. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Y